Well, good morning, everybody. Wow, that was awesome. Uh, I am always very honored to come and share on a Sunday morning, and uh, we're in the middle of Summer in Psalms, which has been really cool to see a lot of different perspectives from different people through the Psalms, and one theme that's kind of run through is uh, the Psalms are really emotional, right? (laughs) We've seen uh, happiness and compassion. Last week was hope, and we're going to stick with that theme. So today we're talking about desire. Not necessarily like the soap opera kind of desire, although it could be that kind of desire. Uh, we all, as humans, have desires. Uh, it, uh, right now, I desire sleep because <laughs> we found some kittens about a week ago who were about a week old, and we've been up every two to three hours feeding them, right? So sometimes our desires are for our basic needs, like when we're newborns, right? We desire food and sleep and pooping, right? <laughs> Um, the kittens are similar, right? And so we have a little flashback to what that was like. Um, but as we age, our desires change, right? So as little kids, our desires might be simple, like cake and a puppy. As we become teenagers, maybe it's more of a desire for independence, and maybe that first love, boyfriend, girlfriend desire starts to grow in us. As adults, maybe we move into the work world and our desires change towards maybe achievements, right? A certain title, a certain salary cap. Um, But I think that what we need to recognize is it's not necessarily the thing that we're desiring. It's what we think that thing is going to bring into our life, right? We desire that salary number because we think that it will bring us this fulfilling life because we'll have all the money to all the desires of our hearts, right? But maybe you've experienced this, and we've talked about this in past sermons, that we pursue something, and then when we achieve it, there's like this initial emotional fulfillment feeling of accomplishment or achievement, but then it fades, right? It's a temporary kind of experience, and then we have to get on track for some new thing that we think is going to bring us fulfillment, right? Um, And so it's kind of like, we used to call it the rat race. (laughs) It's like a treadmill, right? Where you're just constantly chasing after the next thing that's going to bring you fulfillment. Um, But I think that what we're going to learn today when we get into our scripture is that's not necessarily the way that God designed desire to work. He did design it, but he designed it to work in a very specific way. And... um, When I was in my late 20s, it's kind of where I found myself, right? I had, uh, I was married, I had kids, I had a career, and there was still something missing. No matter what I tried, what hobby, what friendship, it didn't bring me that thing that I was looking for, this void that I was trying to fill. And I thought if I could just find something that gives me purpose and passion, then I'll feel fulfilled, right? And I just wasn't finding it. Finally, It took me a long time. I'm a little bit of a late bloomer. I was in my late 20s, and uh, I realized that there must be something more than me, something beyond me, because I have not been able to fulfill myself, right? Nothing that I'm trying is working. So I entertained the idea that maybe there's something more than me, and I started looking to religion for my answers. Um, But sometimes... We don't get to that place, and we pursue other kinds of desires that lead us to kind of a dark place. So instead of a treadmill, we end up in a trap, right? Sometimes our desires can lead us to places of addiction or obsession, right? Anyone ever see fatal attraction, right? That's not the kind of fulfillment that we actually are looking for. Um, And James 1, I'm going to read in just a minute, it kind of describes this trap, what it feels like. So James uh, chapter 1, verse uh, verse 14 and 15, it says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I think this is a really good description of when we misdirect our desire on the wrong things, how it can turn out not so good for us, right? But fortunately, that's not God's plan for desire. And we're going to read in Psalm 19 today and look at 
where he asks us to direct our desire and what the results or the rewards are that we get when we do that. So let's pray and uh, then we'll dig in. Dear Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you that you are a God who loves us, that you created this desire in us and that you show us where to direct that desire. I just pray that each person will hear you as they're guided by the Holy Spirit today to hear what you have to say for them specifically and the response that you're asking them to take. We pray these things in your powerful name. Amen. If uh, I'm going to be reading the scriptures off my screen. The, they'll also be on the screens on the sides here. Uh, if you would like to read out of a Bible, we have some at both doors next to the black boxes. If you do not own a Bible at home, please take that home with you as our gift to you because we want you to be able to have scripture in your home. So let's jump in. So we're going to be in Psalm 19, starting in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Just stop there for a moment. Have you ever been out in the country or maybe on a mountaintop, and there's no ambient light, and you just look up, and there's so many stars, like you can't even fathom, right? And then there's the moon, and if we had a telescope, we could look beyond, and we've seen those amazing pictures of other galaxies. Like, that is God's handiwork, right? So it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork day to day, pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world." So as we go through this psalm, there's kind of sections. The first part of it is kind of about God and what he does. And then the second part is about us. So this is the first part about God, that he reveals himself through his creation. Right? He gave the heavens a job to do, which was to declare the glory of God. And it talks about how it speaks to us. It speaks to us. When I was, before I became a Christian, I would never say I was an atheist. I would always say I was an agnostic. Because there was something in me that couldn't say there is no God. And I think it was this. I think that it was this when I looked at the world around me, there was something in me that knew it was possible that there was a God. It was at least possible that there was a God, right? And uh, Romans 1.20 says this about creation. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. He wants there to be no excuse but for us to know him. He created the heavens. They declare his glory. He created us. I think that's why we have this connection. We understand when we look at creation that there's something happening there. He initiates a relationship with us through his creation, through what we see. It speaks to us, and, um, and he's inviting us to join him in a relationship. Let's look at the next verse. Starting in verse 4, uh, the second half. In them, so in the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun. Whenever I see this in the Bible, has set a tent for, I think of it like, he set a home for. So he, he created a home for the sun in the heavens. And the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Very descriptive language. But to me, it's like this feeling of, I got this. I can do this. I was made to do this, right? Excitement about doing it. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So he gave the heavens a job to do, to declare his glory. And then he gave one star out of all of those bazillion stars that we see in the sky. One star, he gave a specific job to heat the earth. And I think that he gives each of us a specific job on this earth also. And what we're going to talk about today, I think, is how he prepares us so that he can work through us to do that job. But that's kind of a different sermon, so we're going to stick to the one we're on, but... He gives uh, the son a job to do. Starting in verse 7. So here it says the law of the Lord. 
And uh, a few weeks ago, Matt was talking on, on Psalm 1. He actually referenced Psalm 19. I thought he was stealing my sermon for a minute, but uh, <laughs> he just touched on it for a second. Uh, but this whole section that we're looking at is about the word of God, okay? And so we're going to look and see what does it say about his word? How does it describe his word? And then what it says his word produces in our life, okay? So let's read through it, and then we'll, we'll kind of dissect it. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So first we saw that God created or reveals himself through creation. Here we see he reveals himself through his word. And so we're going to break this down. One, I'm going to quote Matt from uh, his song because I really liked the way he said this. He said, we need to know the word of God to know the God of the word. He, he gives us his word because he's trying to reveal something about himself to us, okay? So first, let's look at what it calls his word. So we see several words that he uses there, they, uh, the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the rules. These were like his instructions for us, his warnings for us, right? He wants to direct us in the right way. His wisdom, his mandates, his laws, right? A friend of mine once said that she heard that Bible, B-I-B-L-E, stood for basic instructions before leaving earth. And I love that, <laughs> right? Because really that's what it is, right? We live here on earth and his word is his way of showing us this is how you need to live while you're here on earth, right? And he reveals himself through it. The next thing that we see is it kind of gives a lot of adjectives to his word. So it says his word is perfect, sure, right, and pure. So it's complete. It's whole. It's like enduring. It doesn't change. We can always trust it, right? But then it says it produces something in us. So to me, this is where we start to see like if we direct our, our desire in one way, we get temporary reward. This is kind of a glimpse at maybe other kinds of rewards that are available when we direct our desire in the right ways. Um, so here's what it says uh, in this passage about what his word can produce in us. So the first one it says is revives our soul. When I looked uh, into this, it, this has this idea of returning movement back to the point of departure. So if I think back to that initial decision when I kind of decided to believe that maybe there is a God and I started a relationship with him, that first decision, well, before that, I was kind of off on my own, right? When I made that decision, it brought me back to the point of departure where my soul wants to be on, on the path with God. But this also happens on the daily, right? Daily, <laughs> I go off on my own side, following my own pursuits. His word has the power to bring us back to the point of departure every single time. The next thing it says is his word makes us wise. It gives us an intelligent attitude towards life and living, right? It gives us a way to see the world through his wisdom instead of through the world's wisdom, right? Because the world will kind of get us askew almost every time. Um, then it says it rejoices our heart. And maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've had a time when you heard something on a Sunday morning, when you opened your Bible, through a devotional, on the radio, something that was said in God's word just spoke to you and it hit you right where you needed it, right? Uh, and that's the power of his word. And then the, the last one that it lists is it enlightens our eyes, and when I was thinking about this, I was thinking back to that time before I was a Christian. I had tried to read the Bible because I was convinced that <laughs> I had no religious upbringing, really, too, not too much. And so I was convinced I was going to figure out which religion I was, right? I was going to look at all the religions and figure out which one I was supposed to be. And so I did read the Bible at that point when I was trying to figure it out, but it, it, it didn't really have any meaning for me. It didn't hit me 
in the same way that it does now. So it wasn't until I made a decision to be in a relationship with the God of the word that his word was meaningful to me, right? Um, I think the other thing I remembered was before I became a Christian, um, I already had children, and I had this book that I bought called How to Make Your Children Mind Without Losing Yours. And I thought, I need that, right? And so I read that book. It had lots of practical advice. I really got a lot out of that. Well, then after I became a Christian, my kids had kind of grown, and they were in a new phase, and I was losing my mind. And so I went and I got that book back out, and um, I could not believe how full of scripture it was. It was a Christian book by a Christian author, and it was filled with scripture. But before I became a Christian, it went right over my head. I had no idea. It didn't have any meaning for me. So that's the other thing that his, his word does for us. It enlightens our eyes. It lets us see all the places where he's working and the ways that he's working. Um, but... As wonderful as all these rewards are, I think there's something that we need to look at more closely because just because his word exists does not automatically unlock those things in our life, right? Because before I was a Christian, his word existed, and yet I wasn't experiencing these things from his word. I wasn't having my soul revived or my heart rejoiced. So there must be something that happens that unlocks that. So I think we're going to see that in the next verses. Starting in verse 10, more to be desired. So it's talking about his word. His word is more to be desired. Are they then gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb? So I want you to picture your dining room table. If you don't have a dining room table, picture some other big flat surface in your house. And imagine that it's piled with bars of gold and gold chains and gold rings And imagine, like, if you saw that in your house, how would you feel about that? You probably would be excited. Think of all the things that I can buy. Uh, You might even feel like you needed to guard it, to keep it, right? Um, This is saying that his word, his scriptures, are way more valuable than that. And we need to desire his word in that way, that it is more valuable than any treasure that we can think up for ourselves. So that's the first way that we unlock it. We have to direct our desire towards the word of God as our biggest treasure. Then if we keep going in verse 11, it says, moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And to me, that's the key. In keeping them, there is great reward. So it doesn't say um, knowing his word unlocks those rewards. It's the keeping. So uh, we respond with a desire for his word. So first God reaches out to us through creation. He reveals himself through creation. Then he reveals himself through his word. And now we need to respond. So we respond with a desire for his word. And Knowing his word and keeping his word, not the same, right? I can know every diet book and information, but if I don't keep what it says, nothing happens, right? So knowing is important. We have to know it, but it's the keeping that produces something in us, that changes us, transforms us. Um, And the keeping is like our submission and our obedience to want what God wants more than what we want to believe that God knows what we need more than we know what we need or want. Um, So how do we direct our desire? So we just watched Indiana Jones, um, because the new movie is coming out, so I always have to go back and watch all of them. Uh, We just watched uh, the, the one where he has to go find the Holy Grail. And that picture of him in that scene, I think is a great like picture of what it looks like to direct our desire. So he is facing a chasm. On the other side is what he needs, and he has to take a leap of faith. But he doesn't actually, up until that point, really believe in God and the things of God. His dad did, but he didn't. But he wants to save his dad. And so there's this moment where he closes his eyes, and it's him directing his 
desire to believe that it's true. And then he steps out in faith. And to me, that's like that decision of faith, that first decision that we make. We can't 100% know, but we can take a leap of faith. So I took a leap and said, I believe that there's a God and I believe that he has a plan for me. And then I stepped forward and said, I'm going to see what happens, right? Um, We are the only ones that can do that. We're the only ones that can direct our will and our desire in a specific way. Matthew 6.21 talks about it like this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we direct where our treasure is and our heart follows, right? Sometimes we wait for our heart to feel something and then we want to follow what our heart feels, but it's actually the other way around. We have to decide what it is that we're going to prioritize, what we're going to see as the most valuable thing in our life, and then all of our decisions align with that and our heart follows along. Verse 12. So here's the second part of what we need to do. It says, who can discern his error? So this is the psalmist praying. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. The hidden faults are like those sins that we're doing on accident. We don't even realize that we're sinning, right? Maybe it's just something we haven't been convicted of yet, um, but we don't even know. So he's saying, declare me innocent of those because I don't want to do them and I want to be in right standing with you. I want to be innocent in your sight. So make me innocent of those things. And then he says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Those are the ones that we know full well they are sins, right? But what he says is, let them not have dominion over me. He's praying for God to help him to not sin in those ways. He recognizes that his desire is to move towards that sin, and he's praying for God to not let that power hold over him. Then it says, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And I love that last part where he puts it back on God. So this whole thing is, he's not saying, let me muster up the energy to not sin so that I will be in right standing with God. He's saying, God, help me not to sin. Let it not have power over me because I desire to be in right standing with you. We respond with a desire to live righteously. And when I say that righteously, I just mean in a right relationship with God, that we're walking in step with him, that we're putting his ways above our own ways, that we're wanting to live that kind of life with him. We're directing our desire in that way. Matthew 6.33 helps us out. Now, this is the New Living Translation, but I liked the way that the words... uh, So it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And I think that that is an important word, that need word, because sometimes we are praying for a lot of things that we want, right, that we think are going to bring us joy or happiness or fulfillment. Um, And this doesn't say that God's going to give us everything we want. It says that he's going to give us everything we need. And like the little kittens that we have, they have eye infections. We have to put drops. They do not want that. (laughs) They do not want that. But we know that they need them. And there's a a country verse, I don't remember the singer, that says, uh, thank God for unanswered prayers. Because sometimes we're praying for things and we're like, if I just had that thing and we don't get it, but retrospectively we look back and go, oh my gosh, that was a train wreck. I'm glad I didn't get that, right? He knows what we need. And so this whole idea of he calls God his rock and his redeemer, it's about that trust, trusting that God knows what we need. And by putting him first, we're going to get what we need, right? So the big idea I get from this script, the, these verses is God created us to desire him above all else. And then these rewards are unlocked for us. But these rewards are not the temporary kind that we get from the world. They're long lasting. This revive our soul and, and enlighten our eyes. We get to keep those from now and through eternity. 
They're a part of our inner man, right? When God transforms us, that's something that we get to keep forever. And I mentioned before, it's another sermon, but I'm just going to... I think that's how he prepares us to do the work that he has for us, is by transforming our inner self to be yielding to him so that he can kind of wield us as a weapon in the world, right? For his kingdom's purpose. First John... Um, I think this is really, really key to understand this process. It's not us mustering up our strength to be good enough for God. It says uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And I feel like this goes with what we just talked about. The psalmist didn't say, I'm going to not sin to make you happy, God, so that we can be in a right relationship. He asked God to help him to not sin. And so here this verse that says, if we pray, uh, if we ask anything according to his will, well, if he tells us to do it, it is his will, Right? Do not steal, honor your mother and father, pray for your enemies, right? If he tells us to do those things, that's his will, and we can confidently pray that he will help us to do those things. And it says that he will hear us, and he will give us our requests. Now, if I ask for a Mustang, I don't know if that's in his will. <laughs> it may or may not, right? So I can't be confident about that request. It may happen, it may not. But the things that are his will, I can confidently pray those and know that he's going to do it and know that I'm going to be transformed, right? And when I was a, a new Christian and I started reading his word, my eyes were enlightened. I was like, oh, my gosh, there's so much great stuff in here. Like, I was obnoxious about it. <laughs> but what would happen is I didn't just believe what someone told me on a Sunday about his scripture. I read it for myself. And then I tested it. Right? So it said, pray for your enemies. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. But then I did it. And what I found was that my circumstance wasn't necessarily changed. That person wasn't necessarily changed. But I was changed because I saw them in a different way now. My heart was softened. And then it allowed for forgiveness to bear fruit. So he changes us when we do this process. So I'm just going to uh, share one story. So it's a, a story that started like 20 plus years ago, and it's kind of an example of what we've been talking about. So as a young Christian, uh, we learned this uh, concept of tithing. And we learned tithing means 10%, and so any income that came into our house, then we should give 10% of it back to God. Not because God needs it. He owns everything. But because, and not because the church needed it. Because he can move whatever money he wants around for the church. It had to do with me, right? Tithing had to do with me. And so the, once we felt like, okay, God wants us to do this, the next time we paid the bills, we uh, looked at all the income and we looked at 10% and we said, oh my gosh, we cannot do that. So then we looked at 5%. And it still was so much. We ended up at 2.5%. 2.5% was our little baby step into tithing. Um, and we wrote the check. And then at the end, I balanced our checkbook, which we used to do back then. And <laughs> I don't do it anymore. Uh, and I found an error in my favor for the same amount. Not exactly, but around the same amount that we had just written that check for. And it was like this little message from God of, it, it's okay. <laughs> you can do it, right? And then we bumped it up to 5%. And that we got used to 5%. And then finally we're like, okay, we just need to, we're in. We need to do the 10%, right? And the first time that we did the 10%, I remember I, was, I wrote the check, but then I was afraid that we were going to run out of money before the next paycheck because it was a big chunk of money. But I wrote it anyways. And then I went out to the 
mailbox and there was a rebate check from some random weirdo place that we didn't even know or expect for basically the same amount. And I clearly heard God say, I told you I would do this. So we just tithe from that point forward. And we've been doing it for 20 plus years now, right? And we just had a revelation this past year. So this past year, we had all of these financial things come up. $4,000 truck repair, $2,500 car repair. Then someone smashed into my car and there was body damage. Then my engine seized in my car. <laughs> then we had dental bills and most recently an $11,000 plumbing bill. But what we noticed every time one of those things popped up over the past year, we didn't freak out. We didn't get scared. We didn't stop tithing because we needed the money. We just knew that God was gonna take care of it, that we just kept our tithing going, right? Because it's, the tithing didn't change the outside world. It changed me, right? Instead of trusting in God or in money as my provider or as my security, Every time I write that check for 10%, it's me telling me <laughs> that I trust God. I trust God more than my circumstances or anything like that. So we're going to end with uh, an exercise. So this is something that we do in our cruise. And so um, in our cruise, like, those are kind of like our Bible studies where we, we come together. We do three things. We ask, we seek, and we knock. So the ask is checking in. How's everyone doing? How's God working in our lives and pushing each other back towards God? The seek is reading scripture. And then the knock is where we set a timer for five minutes and we each pri- uh, silently pray that based off of what we read in scripture that day, what is God calling us to do in response? And so that's what I'm going to have us do. In the, in the midst of the next song, just silently pray. Based off of the scripture that you heard today, what is God calling you to do? Is it to make that first decision of faith? Is it some other thing that you feel he's telling you that he wants you to trust him in? So uh, let's pray. At the end, uh, once you've finished your... Um, Silent prayer, we do have communion at the back and the side. You can get up and and take that. Uh, So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you for this time this morning that we can all listen to your word. And I just pray that as each person prays today, that you'll speak very clearly to them about how you want them to respond to the scriptures that they heard today. We just thank you that you are God that looks at each of us uniquely and has a plan for our life. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.